notes, I was shocked to learn that it was in 2010 that I started to get interested in this area. And while I was thinking about my experience with possible MH crises over my, come September will be 36 years as a certified nurse anesthetist, the three times that I was afraid that I was going to be involved with the crisis were all here. We're all here. <clears throat> the case that got me started on this was a five-year-old boy that were doing tonsils and adenoids for Dr. Rosen. And all of our children that we do mass pinpoints are, are exposed to triggering agents. All of them. If they haven't got an IV, they're exposed to a triggering, triggering agent. So, did a mass conduction, sebal fluorine, and for our routine, <clears throat> went off to sleep, heart rate between 120 and 168, which is pretty normal for kids of that age. Tried to grab his mouth open so I could intubate him. And again, five year old child, all I could do was open his mouth two centimeters this wide. That's it. So I couldn't get a good view, and the anesthesiologist that was with me said, All right, let's go ahead and give him succinylcholine to see about getting more relaxation to improve your view. Sucks didn't do anything. As a matter of fact, I think it was a little bit tighter. But for some reason, I was able to visualize the vocal cords without breaking his teeth, put the tube in, and Dr. Rosen was able to get the tonsils out. It was a miracle. But while we were doing the, this case, I kept thinking, master muscle spasm, master muscle spasm. This could be bad, but I could not remember how many cases with master muscle spasm converted to full-blown MH. As you saw with the earlier film, 20%. But again, I couldn't remember. Case got done, things were dried up, child was awakened enough to meet criteria and was extubated, and I took him to the recovery room. I was met in the recovery room by one of our very skilled ICU trained nurses. I mean, seriously. I love taking patients to her because I know that she is so good. And I said, you know, I was a little bit suspicious of master muscle rigidity on this child. So uh, I'd like you to just keep an eye out for MH. Because MH can occur not just during the anesthesia. The anesthesia, but it can happen in the recovery room, and it can happen relatively late. <coughs> well, as soon as I said MH and looked for the signs, the individual <coughs> looked at me with the deer in the headlight look. So it's okay, it's time for me to do a bedside in service so that we can keep an eye out. I didn't think it was going to convert, but again, it was back in my mind, it could. <coughs> So, things went fine, the kid went home. Again, that's when I started to look deeper into what we would do here in this facility if we had an MH crisis. Now, Diane has been involved with an MH crisis. Anyone else in the room? I'm nervous. It will take up all of our man. We're not in the medical center. We don't have specific resources to intervene quickly. Everyone knows, Tammy in particular knows, that we've got to be getting on the phone to get RT support in here. We don't have the ability to do all of the laboratory values that are necessary in this facility. So, Joe, all of you guys are going to be running, running fast. We don't have the recommended 36 miles of gantling that in-house says that we should have. And that was a concerted decision, a corporate decision, because we're
we're so close to the medical center. We have enough to take care of a full crisis of a child, but we only have enough dantrolene to do the initial uh, treatment of someone my size. And again, I'm relatively slender compared to most of our patients here. <laughs> so, we're going to be running. We're going to be running in the operating room. We're going to be getting more dantrolene. We're going to be calling for people in RCC and pre-op because the eye stats that we have, none of the nurse anesthetists are signed up or in the database to run them. So, we're going to be tied up taking care of the patient. We're going to have to call someone from RCC. Sandy's come in in the past to run the eye stats for us. Tammy's going to be calling RT to come over because in this building we don't have eye stat capability to do blood gases. So we're going to be calling. We're going to be jumping. We're going to be tear, uh, tying up many uh, of the resources here <clears throat> to the point where someone's got to tell Dr. Weiner, no, we can't start your case. You're going to have to wait. When Kathy Bordick was here, her experience with an MH crisis from a simple case, from an electroconvulsive therapy, an ECT, 15 minutes, start to finish, full blown crisis. She said that they used all of the dantrolene in that hospital and from three other hospitals in the Pittsburgh area. So, manpower intensive. It's going to shut down the operations here. Now, we could think, well, should we do patients with the possibility of MH in this building? Depends on the anesthesiologist that's looking at the patient. Some feel that, oh, if we know that there's a possibility of MH, that's perfect. We'll get things ready. In today's modern environment, we've got non-triggering agents. <clears throat> I've anesthetized the same man twice in this building, and there was, a, again, a question of MH in his background. He's never had it confirmed by muscle biopsy, but he's had very, very unusual responses that made people go, geez, I don't know what's going on. We're going to have to talk with Andrew. <coughs> As I said, he was okayed for surgery here in this facility twice that I am aware of. Uh, he got through it okay, but it was miserable for me. I wasn't real happy about taking care of him because even though he wasn't showing me the full picture of an MH crisis, there were enough funny things that were going on that if I was operating by myself out in a small 50-bed hospital, after going through all of the decision-making process, I would have popped dangerous only because I didn't know what else to do. So, long story to get to. Should they be done here? Maybe yes, maybe no, depending on the anesthesiologist that uh, is in charge of signing off on the clearance papers. Now, that leads me to well, how do we know that these patients are at risk for MH? <clears throat> and that goes to the importance of preoperative evaluation, asking the right questions. Because you can't look at them to see what's going on. There aren't good tests that are readily available to see if they're MH susceptible. There are only five facilities in the United States that will do muscle biopsies to check for MH. <clears throat> Fortunately for us, one of them is Wake Forest Baptist, just down the road. There are only four facilities in the United States that will do blood tests for genetic testing. 
genetic testing, as I'm going to show you on this uh, video from M House, is out there. It may help us, it may not help us. The gold standard for evaluation is the muscle biopsy. And the only reason that someone had, would have a muscle biopsy would be if, when questioned, have you ever had any problems or has anyone in your family ever had problems with anesthesia? And if the answer is, yes, I had an uncle that died. Yes, my father had an uh, emergency that they thought he was going to die. That's the only way that you know. So, the importance of a good preoperative evaluation cannot be overemphasized. So, let's see if I can have technology help me now. This is a video describing the procedure for performing a muscle biopsy and taffing halothane contraction test. The procedure was performed at Wake Forest University Baptist Medical Center in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Thanks go to Dr. Joseph Tobin, Chairman of the Department of Anesthesiology and also member of the Board of Directors of MHAUS. The muscle biopsy involves surgery under general anesthesia with non-triggering agents or spinal or regional nerve block anesthesia. The testing on the muscle is a physiologic test on fresh living muscle and can only be performed in select centers. A full list of such centers is available on this website. The video contains graphic scenes during the surgical procedure and may not be appropriate for all viewers. Discretion is advised. The patient has been anesthetized but to sleep with non-triggering general anesthetic medications and the monitor is continually checked to observe vital signs. A laryngeal mask airway and airway device is placed to assist the patient's breathing and her eyelids are taped to protect them from drying or injury. Vital signs continue to be monitored to be sure the patient's condition is ready for the procedure to continue. Anesthesia vaporizers are taped off to prevent accidental vapor exposure from a an agent that will trigger malignant hypothermia, as the patient may be MH susceptible. The medical staff are performing the universal protocol or timeout procedure to verify patient procedure and site of surgery. All team members must agree before the incision is made. The surgical site has been marked with the patient's initials to confirm the correct site of surgery. This is outside of the left leg above the knee. Sterile cleansing of the area to be biopsied is demonstrated. The area to be biopsied is draped to keep the site sterile, prevent site infection, and the incision is made through the skin about 7 to 8 centimeters in length, or 4 inches long. After the incision, the surgeon controls the bleeding and deepens the incision using a special device, an electrocautery or coagulation device. Layers of fat and tissue are cut through, cauterizing blood vessels to minimize blood loss. Surgical dissection continues until the muscle level is reached. The sheath surrounding the muscle is cut to reach the actual muscle tissue to be excised for the contraction test. The muscle section is cut from the thigh for the contraction testing. The muscle is about 8 centimeters or 3 to 4 inches long and is quickly taken to the lab in a physiologic solution. <coughs> Care 
is taken not to injure the muscle. The muscle section is cut from the thigh for the contraction testing. The muscle section is taken immediately to the laboratory for testing. The muscle is taken to the lab for dissection into multiple separate strips for testing. Each muscle section is tied off with anchors at each end. Muscle strips are kept alive with oxygenated buffer solution until placed in the actual testing apparatus. Muscle sections are carefully stretched in a physiologic bath until a baseline tension is achieved. <coughs> the monitoring equipment is attached and the baseline tension recorded. Muscle sections are then electrically stimulated and the contraction reaction or twitch of the muscle is recorded. That is, transduced from the muscle tension pulling at the plate at the top of the equipment. Each twitch is shown on the graphs which follow in this video. This halothane vaporizer is used to initiate halothane exposure to the muscle suspended in the physiologic bath at 37 or 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. When halothane reaches the muscle, the contraction may increase slightly in a normal muscle or severely in an MH susceptible muscle strip. The test is performed on other freshly prepared muscle strips with caffeine. <coughs> After a baseline tension is achieved, the muscle strips are electrically stimulated and twitch strength is recorded as shown already. Caffeine is then added to the physiologic bath in increasing concentrations, and the twitch strength generated is recorded. Tracing 1 is a halothane contracture test, which is negative for MH susceptibility. The muscle develops very little baseline tension upon exposure to halothane. This tracing, tracing 2, is from a halothane contracture test, which is positive for MH, with severe tension developed by the muscle upon exposure to 3% halothane. Note the increasing rise of the baseline tension. Tracing 3 is a caffeine contracture test which is negative for MH susceptibility. The contracture in this case does not begin until 8 millimolar caffeine concentration, which is a normal response. Tracing 4 is a caffeine contracture test which is positive for MH susceptibility. Note that the contracture begins at 2 millimolar caffeine, and it develops a very large tension increase of the baseline. MH susceptibility is tested using a physiologic test. In the U.S., it is standardized as the caffeine halothane contracture test, or CHCT, while in many other nations, a slightly different protocol is used called the in vitro contracture test, IVCT. These tests are done on living tissue and can only be performed at specialized centers where the tissue can be immediately prepared for testing while it is still living and special equipment is available. Local anesthesia is generally not used in the wound until after the muscle is extracted. Local anesthetics may impair the muscle's ability to respond and will possibly cause a false test result. What to expect? The patient should have an uneventful anesthetic recovery 
and usually stays in the recovery area for at least 90 minutes following the biopsy. If local anesthesia is placed in the wound after the muscle has been removed, there may be very little pain upon awakening from general anesthesia. The surgical site is usually sore for a few days following the procedure. We recommend no vigorous exercise for one week following the procedure to allow the incision to heal and gain strength. The scar will be as long as the incision and usually two or three millimeters in width. The incision is often closed with dissolvable suture so the patient will not have to have the suture removed. Patients are usually allowed to travel home the following day. Although this is an outpatient procedure, the patient is often requested to stay in the city where the biopsy is performed on the first post-operative night. Painkillers, such as opioids, may be prescribed for a few days, but is generally not necessary. This video is for educational purposes only of patients and healthcare providers and is not intended as an instructional manual for the performance of the biopsy or testing of muscle tissue. Many details have not been included to show in the video. This video is copyright 2009 by the Department of Anesthesiology of Wake Forest University Health Sciences. Okay. The muscle biopsy test is the gold standard to rule out or to confirm that a patient has got the MH trait. I talked about the gentleman that I've anesthetized two times here. <clears throat> For both of the instances, we knew that there was something funny that was going on, so a non-triggering technique was used. He was induced, and I went through, God, I don't know how many big bottles of propofol to keep that guy on the table. But as soon as he was induced, his heart rate went into a, what I thought was a blazing tachycardia, in spite of the trailer truckloads of narcotics and other drugs that I was giving him for non-triggering techniques. <clears throat> Again, I couldn't understand it. But he did not develop, as he was breathing on his own, tachypnea, breathing quickly, muscle rigidity, or increased carbon dioxide output. So his tachycardia was the primary thing that was going, what the hell is going on? He laughed at the beta blocker that I gave him. Esmolol and other beta blockers that I gave him didn't touch him. So after the second time that I anesthetized this guy, again, after seeing him one time, coming back, doing it again with another non-triggering technique with a few different curves in the, uh, the anesthetic management. He reacted the same way. <clears throat> I kind of went out of my comfort level afterwards to go into the waiting area, talk with the wife, and I said, you know, we've talked about this before. You need to talk with your primary care provider. You need to seriously consider getting a muscle biopsy test. The genetic tests, the blood tests that are sent to one of the four centers in the United States, really isn't all that helpful yet. If there is a known family member with MH, the blood test may confirm if they know where on the genetic profile the uh, discrepancy is, may. So it's still not in a uh, point that it is 100% uh, effective in ruling in or ruling out the presence of the MH triggering spots. <clears throat> problem here. Again, one of the handouts that I gave you would be this one to just give you a brief overview of what we'd be seeing. Signs of an NH crisis, unexplained tachycardia. Did this guy have it? You bet your life. I think Connie was with me one time when we were with Ed Miller, 
and a child that was doing fine, 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 and then all of a sudden, boom, unexpected tachycardia, unexplained tachycardia. Greg Smith was an attending anesthesiologist. <clears throat> we continued with the procedure, but we called RT over here to do blood gases, and Sandy came into the room to help with other bloods. <clears throat> Again, no problem with increased carbon dioxide, blood pressure, not so bad. <coughs> no problems with generalized rigidity, but again, an unexplained tachycardia. Rising temperature is a late sign. It's a late sign. So in the recovery room, the things that you'd see, tachycardia, tachypnea, they're breathing fast because the tachycardia and the muscle rigidity is producing enough carbon dioxide that they're trying to breathe it off. Their uh, muscle, or excuse me, their uh, responses are that they want to try to breathe it off. Cola colored urine? Well, how would we know it here? That would be something that we put in to help treat and uh, monitor the urine output. Model cyanotic sin and, uh, skin and decreased oxygen saturation. <clears throat> what will kill the patient in the operating room is myocardial problems. Increased CO2 increases heart irritability. Rhabdomyolysis is going to be producing potassium which further increases cardiac irritability. What will kill the patient in the ICU is kidney failure. Now, recently, here in our portion of the state, uh, there has been a news report of a uh, young man that died after exercise with rhabdomyolysis. I left an abstract of an anesthesia and analgesia paper that is, again, amazing <coughs> about the relation with patients that are susceptible with heat stroke and MH. Uh, in the Army, every year during the summer, there are soldiers, usually trainees, that will drop out and die vigorous uh, exercise. Throughout the nation, there are reports of children exercising, playing real hard, developing heat stroke, and dying. Uh, this is a newspaper article from Florida of a six-year-old that died in 2010. On autopsy, and I don't know how they could confirm this, on autopsy, the medical examiner said he developed MH while exercising. So, does that have any impact on us? No. Does that have any impact on emergency departments? Probably not, because all of the symptomatic uh, things that they would be doing to help treat the heat stroke <coughs> would be the same things that they would normally do, with the exception of giving dantropin. Again, scientifically, they cannot prove a direct correlation between MH and heat stroke. The thing that the abstract points out is people that are at risk for MH may not want to be marathon runners. They may not want to exercise uh, real hard because they may be, and let me emphasize that, they may be at greater risk for developing a crisis while they're exercising. Now, the other thing that I wanted, in particular, you guys to know, this is our MH crisis box. 
You know where it lives? Yep. And most everybody does. Works in the anesthesia workroom. As you go into the workroom, you turn to the left, you look at the sink, look down. There's this box. <coughs> if someone is starting to call urgently for the MH box, they want it right now, and people are going to be very, very nervous and excited. If I start to stutter, you know I am very excited at the time. I will be speaking slowly and distinctly, so I don't uh, 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 talk like that. The preparation of dampening that we have here is an older preparation. It takes a lot of effort to get it into solution. So we'll probably be calling a couple people to help reconstitute it. The newer preparations for dantrolene are much easier. Ryanodex is the new name. And Ryanodex comes in a 250 milligram vial, which is a very nice concentration because it will be reconstituted with only 5 cc's rather than 50 cc's of sterile water. <clears throat> and it is the appropriate initial dose for someone maybe a little bit more slender than me, for the 100 kilogram man. So we've got initially with that new preparation make it a lot easier for us. I don't know how much it costs. Dantrolene is still <coughs> sinfully expensive. That's why we share dantrolene between us and the medical center. So do they keep it up over there? Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. right. They're not going to like it. But we're going to have to call them and say, we're sending the runner over right now. Give us your dantrolene. We've got an image crisis. I don't know how much more dantrolene that the pharmacy would have, but the uh, majority of the stock of dantrolene is kept in the main OR. As I said, the loading dose is 2.5 milligrams per kilo. That's not important, except for the anesthesia staff. The preparation of our environment for someone that's got a suspicious NH history is relatively straightforward and a lot easier than it used to be. And again, that falls on the uh, nurse anesthesia staff. The recommendations for the older anesthetic systems is to have it flushed with at least 10 liters per minute of oxygen for at least 20 minutes on older machines. I think our machine, 10 minutes or excuse me, 20 minutes is appropriate. On the machines that are in the main OR, however, an hour, a minimum of an hour of flushing. The reason being is that the newer machines over in the main OR have a lot more plastic. All of our inhalation agents are soluble, so they will bond on the inside to the plastic. So at least an hour on the newer anesthetic apparatus. We've got filters now that after we flush our machine for at least 20 minutes, we can put on. Now, the recommended duration of use for the filters is 90 minutes because that's how long the company has tested the efficacy of the filters in filtering out all of the uh, remnants of inhalation agents. So if we had a case that lasted longer than 90 minutes, probably would be okay by leaving one set of filters on, but we may be wise to change them out. <clears throat> In the American population, the chances of getting killed behind the wheel of your car is 1 in 17,000. The chances of dying or having an NH crisis is one in 10,000. That was a shock to me because I always said, oh, you're at more risk for dying behind the wheel of your car than you are dying under anesthesia. Not if you have an age. So, earlier at the beginning of the talk, I said that when I was brand new, mortality was 80%. 
percent. Now around ten percent. <coughs> That's Dan 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 or Dan Stephanie one oh one. Dan or Stephanie one oh one. So <coughs> Alaska for the recovery span. If we had an image suspicious patient and we do a non-triggering technique and we have no problems at all, they just go through the normal recovery uh, protocol. An hour in stage one, an hour in stage two. The in-house recommendation for that kid that I did with Dr. Rosen, the in-house recommendation was an hour in first stage and keep him in the house at least 12 hours. We did not keep this kid in the house for 12 hours. We kept him probably six hours in the house, <clears throat> but the in-house recommendation is for the masseter muscle rigidity, an hour in stage one, mm -hmm. 12 hours, close monitoring, stage two. If we had the gentleman that okay, so I anesthetized twice, we kept him in stage one for about two hours. Okay. Most of that was because of all okay, the stinking protocol that. that I gave him um, that <coughs> it took a long time to get out of his system. And I think we okay, kept him in stage two for about two hours. But, uh, okay. all right, thanks. if he would have required less of the propofol, I think having the standard recovery Effectiveness or the um, um, for the right word for the uh, caffeine how thing test how accurate is it that is very accurate determined? over eighty percent for accuracy but, uh, the technology has increased greatly over the years uh, it is specifically designed to be more sensitive so if it's going to have any errors it's going to be errors for false positives. Okay? It's going to be errors for false positives. The blood test for the genetic testing, it's still not there. It's still not there. Uh, so that testing, the issues are, who is going to pay for it? Is your insurance company going to pay for it? Tim. Is it going to have to come out of your own pocket? The, so with the genetic testing, so it's going to be like a grand, even though it's a blood test. It's going to be a thousand dollars to do a test that may not be accurate. Mm -hmm. The uh, cost of having the <coughs> muscle biopsy test, God only knows. I don't even know how much it costs to do a tonsil here, let alone all of the things that would go through with harvesting the muscle and then taken immediately to the lab. Again, as I said, we've got five centers in the United States that do the muscle contracture test. With Forge Baptist, we're lucky. The uh, new Walter Reed Bethesda in D.C. The University of Minnesota in Minneapolis. UC Davis on the west coast, and I can't remember where the fifth one is. So, you got to go there. You got to get on the schedule, and then you've got to pay for it. Yes, ma'am. One question. If you find out you do have a positive reaction, what will they do differently if you're scheduled for surgery? The things that we do are, first of all, set up preparation, washing the machine, making sure that we don't expose you to a known triggering agent. And again, now we've got good agents to do that. So again, doing the right preoperative evaluation to get the idea that they could be susceptible. Again, now our preparation isn't all that tough. For here, uh, when I anesthetized that guy twice, 
didn't take long to prepare the machine, didn't take long to prepare the plan. Uh, I did not have the box in the room. Uh, but going through what we would do was part of the prior preparation. If they had a crisis, could we still do it here? Again, that's controversial. Some anesthesiologists on our staff would say yes, others would say no. Uh, my personal opinion, and let me underline that, my personal opinion is that doing it in the big house where they've got a lot deeper well of resources makes a lot more sense. Okay. We've done MH susceptible patients here. We go through the refresher annually. I'm keeping my fingers crossed that we never have a crisis here because believe me, it will shut things down. If we had a full-blown crisis here and once we got the patient stabilized, I believe that the most appropriate thing for us to do would be to keep them in the operating room until we had the ambulance here to transfer them to the ICU. I believe it would be more appropriate to keep them in the OR than even try to take them to RCC. <clears throat> the dantrolene causes a flaccidity, so they're not going to be able to breathe well on their own. They're going to need mechanical ventilation or assisted ventilation. We don't have a ventilator in the building. So keeping them in the operating room until we get the ambulance here, until we can transfer them to ICU, is, I think, the best choice. Now, while we've got the patient stabilized, we're probably not going to be on the phone, but the anesthesiologist probably is going to call for expert help. This is the 800 number for the Malignant Hyperthermia Association of the United States. There are people on call by a phone 24 hours a day. Call the number. They'll be able to talk with someone. And that's 